Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Uh, good morning everyone. Today I will be talking about characterization of materials. So until now you guys might have already studied about uh, what are biomaterials and different types and what are its application and all. So now you have to learn why we need to characterize the materials. So materials when we are characterizing we will make it uh, to understand the properties so that it can be whether a material is accepted as a uh, uh, implant or the medical devices and all. So the biocompatibility of the material is primarily dependent on its property. So to find out its properties we have to characterize the materials. So for developing a new materials also you have to understand the new properties so that it mimics the natural uh, existing organs and other uh, uh, applications and all. So to identify those properties also you need to characterize the materials. The material characterization is primarily divided into two categories. One is based on the engineering properties such as surface properties, mechanical properties, chemical and physical properties and other is totally dependent on biological relationship with the material which is in vitro biocompatibility, in vivo biocompatibility. So surface properties, so surface property is the property uh, primarily dependent on the material and the host cell interaction interfaces. So when a material is implanted into the body the first point of contact is the material surface and the host cells. So the surface should be biocompatible so that it would not be rejected by the host mechanism. Mechanical properties, well you are considering uh, uh, implants such as hip prosthesis and other heavy load bearing uh, applications and all you need to have a good mechanical property which will be uh, understood by uh, characterizing the bulk properties of the material that can be done using the mechanical characterization. Physical and chemical properties, so physical and chemical properties involves uh, understanding the mat material composition and what are its uh, uh, thermal properties and what are its if you are using a scaffold for tissue engineering applications and all uh, you have to understand the porosity and the permeability and how much the water intake it can uh, uh, actually have. So those properties and all come under chemical and physical properties. In vitro biocompatibility, so before going for the clinical application we have to uh, previously test the material with in vitro and in vivo testings. So in vitro biocompatibility involves whether the material is uh, suitable for the cell adhesion, whether there is a immunogenic response from the cells we are the in, vit in vitro studies we are doing, whether there is a protein adsorption whether there is a blood coagulation occurs on the material surfaces and all. In vivo biocompatibility involves uh, testing the material in uh, uh, animal models like, like rats, uh, pig and uh, dog models and all to check whether the uh, material has a same function when you are uh, introducing into a human body. So after all these properties has been uh, done for both at the biomaterial level and the biomedical devices level, it cannot be uh, only for material, if a material I am preparing a material and if it is a biocompatible we cannot say that will be exactly replicated in the uh, devices also because device will have a different structure and different uh, totally function varies. So you have to check in the biomaterial level at first then you have to go for the biomedical applications also. And all these properties cannot be applied for all the materials, so it depends on what type of material, some are nanoparticles, some are uh, flims and some are scaffolds, some are the uh, uh, huge bulk materials and all. So each of these materials will have to be characterized based on the material properties, uh, what type of characterization you have to look and what type of application you are going to look into. So coming into characterization techniques, these are the predominantly five different types. Uh, surface characterization, what are the techniques you can, there are lot of techniques available for the lot of properties but these are the widely used uh, 
techniques uh, used in the biomaterial field. So, surface characterization techniques such as uh, wettability or contact angle measurement, uh, this is a technique where you will find a material surface is hydrophobic or hydrophilic. Hydrophobic is water repelling and hydrophilic is water attracting. X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy which will calculate the elemental composition of the material. What are the elements present on your material surface and what are the chemical bonds present on the material surface that can be found out using X XPS analysis. Secondly, ion mass spectroscopy, it is also a surface technique where you can find out the surface uh, uh, particular atomic composition of the material, whether the uh, how much electron available on the material surfaces and all those can be calculated by secondary ion mass spectroscopy. So, microscopy techniques also comes under the surface characterization, but there are a lot of microscopic techniques available. So, one of the mainly used uh, technique is SEM, scanning electron microscopy that is uh, used in uh, used to uh, observe the morphology of the material surfaces and all. Then transmitant, transmission electron microscopy which is used to uh, see the uh, inside the material surfaces and all. So, I will explain both of those techniques later. Atomic force microscopy, it will check the surface uh, roughness of the materials. So, you can check how much of the material surface is smooth or whether it is rough, those pa parameters will greatly affect the uh, cell attachment and other properties. Then optical microscope will have a variety of uh, mic microscopic techniques such as phase contrast, fluorescent microscope, confocal microscope, all of those comes under optical microscopy. Physicochemical characterization involves FTIR which will uh, characterize the functional groups present on the materials. NMR spectroscopy you can find out what are the bondings available on the, what are the bondings and what are the element, elements present on the uh, materials. X-ray diffraction will tell whether the polymer is a amorphous crystalline or semi-crystalline uh, these things. DSC and TG analysis is a thermal property uh, characterization techniques where you will find out the melting point, degradation, glass transition temperature, those kind of properties can be found out using uh, DSC and TG analysis. Mechanical characterization is uh, uh, hugely important for the bulk uh, uh, load bearing applications. Uh, so, those experiments involve tension and compression, how much of a load it can uh, withstand and how much of compression it can go, fatigue, how long it can be, uh, uh, how long it can be available without any breaking or some breaking or those things, creep and viscous flow, how the polymer uh, actually affects, uh, actually works inside the host system. Then biological characterization, protein adsorption study because the first when you implant a material into a host system, the first in interaction between the host system and the material is the protein adsorption. So, if there is a protein adsorption occurring on your material surface, then that will lead to cell attachment uh, and uh, blood, blood cells attachment also. So, based on the application that can vary. So, if you want your material to not to have any uh, attachment of cells, it should not have any protein adsorption on the material surface. Because when you are going for the blood contacting devices and all, there you do not need a blood cells to attach onto the material surface, because it will lead to blood clot formation inside the devices, which will lead to failure of the device. So, for those applications, we have to check for the protein adsorption studies. And if you are going for the tissue engineering application like wound healing and these things, so you need to have cells attached onto the surfaces and all. So, for that application, you have to have a protein adsorption on the material surfaces and all. So, these are the basic techniques. There are, other than this, there are still lot of techniques are available, uh, which is specific for each of the uh, application we have to look into. So, coming into surface characterization techniques, uh, as I told you earlier, contact angle analysis, XPS, auger electron spectroscopy, which involves the auger electrons. <coughs> Then uh, scan, secondary ion mass spectroscopy, which is known as SIMS. Then FTIR, uh, STM is uh, uh, scanning tunneling microscopy. Then uh, scanning electron microscopy. So each of a uh, technique has a different uh, uh, resolution of how much uh, uh, properties you can identify using those techniques and the cost they have given. So 
all these atomic related uh, composition uh, finding techniques and all will be very highly uh, costly. So, the basic techniques like contact angle analysis, FTR and all it is uh, slightly lesser. So, while developing a new materials and all you can first optimize those materials using the basic techniques, then you can go for the higher end techniques to confirm whether that material has been uh, uh, properly uh, based on your application and all. Okay. So, each of the application I have told you already. So, let us go into contact angle measurement. So, contact angle measurement is to determine the wettability of the surface uh, and to estimate the surface energy. So, when a material is introduced the first the liquid uh, solution from the host mechanism will spread on the material surface. So, that primarily affects how the proteins are absorbing, how the uh, cells are absorbing on the material surface and all. So, to find out that wettability property whether the material is hydrophobic or hydrophilic we have to use the contact angle measurement. So, the angle between the solid uh, liquid uh, interface and the liquid interface is the contact angle. So, this relation has been given by Young's equation which is uh, interfacial tension between the solid liquid, uh, liquid uh, interface cos theta equal to interfacial energy at solid vapor minus interfacial energy solid liquid uh, interfaces. So, based on this contact angle we can modify the surfaces also. So, already a existing material is available and you want to improve the properties of the existing materials and all. So, you coat a material surface using a different uh, uh, polymer or some other treatment available modification techniques available and all. So, if you do that the contact angle can be varied. So, by varying the surface uh, uh, property you can actually have the better cell attachment, better uh, uh, protein adsorption and all those things available. So, if a material is above uh, 90 degree it is hydrophobic, if it is below 90 degree it is hydrophilic. Okay. If a material is above 150 and all it is super hydrophobic which is uh, uh, known as lotus effect where you see a water droplet on a lotus leaf where the water will retain its bead structure on throughout the surface that is called lotus effect due to its micro structure on the lotus leaf available. So, for me measuring the contact angle we use an instrument called goniometer contact angle goniometer. So, there are different types of measuring contact angle available. Uh, one is a Cecil drop method which is the widely used uh, technique. So, the picture A where you can see there is a material surface and you put a drop on the material surface and you measure the angle between the uh, so solid liquid interface and the liquid interfaces. So, you draw a tangent at the point of contact and measure the angle between the angle on that uh, area interface area. So, that will give you the contact angle that will show whether the material is hydrophobic or hydrophilic. <coughs> then uh, cap captive air bubble method which is similar to the Cecil drop method, but instead of using a liquid we use a air bubble to measure the angle uh, contact angle. So, you have a material surface and it is immersed in a liquid solution and you uh, uh, introduce a drop on the bottom of the surface. So, it will form a uh, bead like structure which will give you the angle between the liquid interface and the solid surface which is the contact angle. So, why we can use where we can use for the captive air bubble measurement is uh, when your material is uh, uh, um, intaking water and all. So, if you are just uh, doing it in an air atmosphere, so the material will hydrate and it will absorb all the uh, water into the material uh, itself. So, if you are using a air bubble method, so it will show the angle because it will be already hydrated with the liquid present on the surfaces and all. Then the capillary, capillary rise method, this is used to measure the angle in small diameter uh, graphs and these things where the all the surfaces having the uh, uniform coating and uh, uniform surface morphology is available to check that we use the capillary rise method. So, that we will use the meniscus to find the angle between the liquid surface and the solid surface. Then the Wilhelmy plate method where we will have a plates metal plates and all if you check the contact angle we introduce the plate. So, both of the sides will have the same angle and by that we can find out the contact angle. Okay. So, the advantages of using contact angle is very cheap and you can 
use it anywhere uh, uh, immediately after preparing a material surfaces and all. Uh, the major disadvantage is if there is a very rough surface or the surface is not uniform and all, it will have a different uh, uh, angle uh, produced on, uh, in different angle uh, will be there. So, next technique is X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, also known as electron spectroscopy for chemical analysis. It is a technique where you can find out what are the elements present on the material surface and all. So, if you have a material and you do not know what are the elements present on the surfaces and all, you can just do this analysis and it will show uh, if you have a um, whatever metal ions or any other organic compounds present. So, it will show all the elements present uh, in the material surfaces and all. So, this XPS is only for the surface technique where it will go up to a depth of 10 Armstrong. Uh, 10 Armstrong. So, up to that uh, depth level only it can measure the elemental uh, analysis. So, below that it would not have that uh, elemental composition and all. So, you, this is mainly used when you are uh, checking for contamination of a material surface or if you are modifying a material surface and to check whether the uh, introduced uh, modification have a effect and all you can check using this uh, XPS uh, method. It is a confirmation technique for the, all those uh, applications and all. So, the it works on the principle that when a x-ray is uh, uh, introduced onto the surface, uh, uh, it will uh, excite the electrons, though the excited electrons will be uh, detected uh, using the detector and it will uh, uh, check for, uh, it will show the binding energy based on the electron int intensity, it will show the binding energy and uh, analyze what it what category it belongs to, whether it belongs to carbon, whether it belongs to oxygen or nitrogen, sulfur and all. So, it works on the principle that binding energy uh, equal to uh, uh, energy of the x-rays uh, minus kinetic energy. So, this is an XPS instrument uh, and this is how the spectrum will look like. So, in XPS analysis there are two categories, uh, two types of analysis. One is uh, wide spectrum analysis and another is a core spectrum analysis. So, wide spectrum analysis uh, you can identify the oxidation states and the elements present throughout the surfaces and all. So, like have you, you can see at the top graph there is a uh, wide spectrum analysis where you can uh, actually see the oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, sulfur. So, if you have uh, other uh, elements present also it will show that. So, it will be like a elemental uh, percentage you can find out from this uh, spectrum. Whereas, the core level spectrum where you can identify what type of chemical bonds formed in the carbon uh, uh, carbon based uh, spectrum. So, carbon based spectrum would be around 285 uh, binding energy. So, if you look at the carbon based spectrum itself, so you can see that uh, peak peak uh, uh, each of the peaks is for the different binding. So, you have a um, for the normal uh, C C bond and C O bond and uh, acid bonds and ester bonds. So, all these bonds you can find out using the uh, core level spectrum analysis. So, by this core level spectrum analysis you can find out the oxidation state valency of the valency electrons, uh, valency state of the elements. Uh, then if you are attaching a molecule, so you can find out whether the bonding has been properly done on the material surfaces and all. So, all those things can be confirmed using the core level spectrum. Okay. One of the disadvantage of using XPS is that the sample would be analyzed under high vacuum condition. So, if your sample is not uh, stable in a high vacuum condition, it is difficult to do XPS. So, coming into microscopic techniques, microscopic techniques also involve uh, comes under the surface characterization uh, techniques only, uh, but it has a wide applications like uh, uh, fluorescent microscope can actually see how the organelles and how the nucleus and all looks inside the cells and all. Then uh, transmission electron microscope will look inside the material surface, not only the surface looks inside the materials and all. So, to find out the morphology we primarily use the microscopic techniques and each of the microscopic techniques has a different uh, depth and different resolution it can go up to. So, it can go from uh, atoms to the cells which 
cells and uh, normal uh, materials you can go. Uh, the size will range from uh, uh, millimeter to nanometer and some microscopic recent techniques and all have go up to Armstrong, Armstrong levels also. So, up for light microscopy you can see up to 200 nanometer and if it is a electron microscopy you can go up to nanometer size and all. So, this is a uh, schematic representation of optical microscope and a fluorescent microscope. In optical microscope you will have a lens piece and uh, uh, light source and you will keep a sample inside and uh, based on the light source uh, uh, the sample would be absorbed to the magnifi magnification piece and the objective piece to see the uh, whatever sample you are observing. So, the optical microscope has a lot of uh, types of phase contrast to check uh, whether the cells would be in a, uh, uh, observed based on the phase difference between the cells because the light would be absorbing the cells would be absorbing some of the light. So, that cells and all would be a dark uh, surface and uh, lights which are not absorbed by the cells would be a brighter side. So, that will have a phase contrast uh, uh, microscopy and uh, confocal microscopy based on the uh, magnification parameter and those things uh, it will vary. And fluorescent microscope where you will have a, a fluorescence uh, uh, where you have a fluorescence exposed onto the sample and uh, if you have a fluorophore uh, inside the sample that will get excited and that excited uh, wavelength can be observed using the uh, detector. So, the image shows the fluorescence microscope image, uh, the image is a fluorescent microscope image uh, where you can the green elements are the actin filaments which are the uh, uh, stained using uh, palladin and uh, the blue stains are the nucleus which is uh, stained using hoist stain. So, if you are having a experiment where you are uh, uh, involving nanoparticle encapsulation or if you are introducing a drug into a, a cells and all. So, whether the drug has been properly introduced into the cells uh, or into the materials and all if you want to find out you attach that drug with the fluorophore and if you observe under the fluorescent microscope you can check whether that uh, actually happened or not ok. So, both of those techniques has a lower resolution only you can go up to 200 micro uh, 200 nanometer only you cannot go below that. So, for that purpose we go into scanning electron microscopy. So, this is a schematic representation of the scaling, scanning electron microscopy. The major difference is that here you have a uh, electron as the electron beam as the light source. So, you have an electron beam which is passed down to the uh, electromagnets which will uh, uh, control the electron beam and it will focus on your sample and uh, uh, based on the sample property you can observe the images ok. So, there are two types of detec detection available in uh, scanning electron microscopy. One is secondary electrons and another is backscattered electrons. So, secondary electrons is that whenever your electron source is uh, given and that uh, it will go into the uh, it will excite another electron that scattered electron will be uh, observed observed under secondary electron detector. So, that will have a secondary electron uh, source. Then for backscattered electrons the electron which you are giving so, some of them would be reflected by the sample. So, the same electron when you are detecting that is a backscattered uh, electron uh, detector. So, why these two are? So, when you are having a when you, when you want to see the morphology very in detail and all. So, you want the electrons which are repelled by the surfaces and all. So, that will have only the morphology of the surfaces. So, second the electron will have a depth and all. So, when you have a porous structure and all if you use a second the electron it will have a better image when you want to just observe the morphology and all you can go for backscattered electrons. Then agar electron spectroscopy which is another totally different type of spectroscopy where the detection is based on agar electrons. So, agar electrons are the electrons which are excited from the core level will be replaced from the outer uh, electrons that electrons will produce the energy. So, that will be observed under the detector. So, that will show the atomic composition. So, if you having a, a, a copper or any other metals available. So, those metals it will show how much of the things will be available density. 
So, based on that uh, auger electrons because based on the copper uh, one copper if it is releasing some amount of electrons if there is the composition is high it will release a certain number of electrons. So, that will be observed under the auger electron microscopy. In scanning electron microscopy also you can find out the elemental composition uh, where it will show the percentage of uh, uh, elements uh, present on the surface also. Okay. So, that is called X-ray uh, energy dispersive method. So, this is how the same uh, images looks like. Uh, so, you can see the first five images are the, where the blood platelets are adhering on the material surface. So, this is uh, A is a control sample and all these four are the different treated samples. So, modification different techniques has been used. So, after the techniques the platelet adhesion has been reduced. So, that can be observed under scanning electron microscopy. Then the bottom one is a vascular stent where they have coated a, a material onto the stent. So, to observe the coating has been properly done on the vascular stent they have observed uh, using scanning electron microscopy. So, there are two parameters which are important in microscopy one is magnification and another is resolution. So, magnification determines how much of a magnify you can do a sample and all. Resolution determines how uh, detailed your images are. So, magnification depends on the instrument property and resolution uh, it depends on magnification, but how detailed you can go observe because in scanning electron microscopy. Uh, if I go above uh, 10 nanometer size and all the image would not be detailed. So, you have to go for the higher the end equipment. So, to have that it will have that magnification, but you would not ha have a clear picture and all. So, resolution is very important when you are the, uh, looking into microscopy. So, TEM it also works on the similar principle as SEM, uh, but the idea is that the electron beam will be passed through the sample. So, transmitted through the sample that is why uh, it is called transmission electron microscopy. As you can see in the SEM the sample is at the bottom and if it is reflected based on backscattered or secondary electrons the images would be observed. But in transmission electron microscopy uh, the sample would be at the center and the electron beam would be passed through the sample and that will give the uh, what are the what, are, what is present inside the material and all. If your material is a porous structure and all that the electron would not be would not have any inhibition passing through that porous structure and all. If you have a uh, materials uh, uh, compact materials and all it will based on the density of the material uh, the electron will have a passing transmission will be varying. So, based on that the image would be uh, observed under the transmission electron microscopy. Then coming into sc scanning probe microscopy. So, until now we have observed based on the light source then electron uh, source then scanning probe microscopy is where you have a probe which will have a feedback on the from the surface and it will uh, input into the detector and it will form the images and all. So, scanning microscope has a lot of different uh, uh, techniques based on the application. So, one of the widely used scanning probe microscopy is AFM atomic force microscopy. Uh, in atomic force microscopy itself it is having it is having a different types such as uh, non contact, contact, uh, tapping methods uh, those three techniques are available in atomic force microscopy. Then so, these are the techniques available and uh, based the uses based on the techniques uh, what are the you want to observe. So, we will see atomic force microscopy. So, atomic force microscopy uh, the cantilever is there, cantilever is a small sharp object uh, piezoelectric object uh, which will uh, uh, expand and contract based on the voltage applied onto the uh, cantilever. So, when you are material in contact mode if you are having a material and the cantilever would be placed on the top of the material. So, if, if it is in a flat surface. So, the uh, material will move along the flat surface and it will have a straight without any movement the uh, voltage difference would be constant. So, it will have a flat image and all. 
So, if you have a rough surface and all it will move up and down. So, that will have the voltage difference that would be detected using the detector and it will have that uh, rough image surfaces and all. In non-contact mode what actually happens is that the cantilever will uh, move at a frequency uh, within the resonant frequency of that uh, cantilever and based on the surface atomic uh, surface of the material. Uh, the movement would be uh, inhibited by the electrons on the surface uh, of the material. So, that difference would be observed under the uh, voltage difference that will have a imaging uh, uh, atomic force image that is a tapping method uh, which will be within the resonance frequency. In non contact mode uh, it is also vibrating at a high frequency above the resonance frequency where it would not touch the surface at all, but the uh, van der Waals force and other long range forces available on the surfaces will have a effect on the non contact mode that effect will be observed and uh, into changed into a image. So, that those are the three different things. So, why these three different things are available is some samples would be very sensitive. So, if you are observing under the contact mode the sample will get damaged. So, to avoid that uh, people will go for uh, tapping mode usually. Tapping mode is uh, one uh, which is widely used non contact mode when you have a sample which is very sensitive you do not want to touch the sample at all. So, these are the three different techniques. So, this is a schematic representation of uh, AFM and this is how the image looks like. So, you have a plane surface uh, which is a A and it has a some uh, ridges and all seen and if you modify the surfaces it will have a rougher surface that will be observed. Uh, uh, as a 3D contour uh, you can see that images at all. So, coming into Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. So, when a molecule is uh, exposed to IR uh, radiation it will exert uh, uh, vibrational uh, stretching uh, contraction and bending and all. So, those molecular properties can be uh, converted into Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy spectrum. So, uh, if you are having a molecule uh, methane CH3, if you are exposing it into uh, IR spectrum, that uh, molecule will have a different bending uh, based on the uh, bond between the atoms. So, that can be observed under the uh, FTIR spectroscope. So, there are different types of stretching one is uh, symmetric stretching, asymmetric stretching, scissoring, and blocking. So, if you are having a highly uh, nucleophile it will have a repulsion between the neighboring nucleophile. So, that it will have a uh, stretching uh, uh, observed onto the uh, observed that will be uh, observed under the FTR spectroscopy. So, the different methods of FTR. So, FTR can be used for surface technique also and for bulk composition also. So, if you are having a material surface want to check the functional group. So, each functional groups will have a different uh, uh, stretching and bending. So, based on that we can identify the functional groups. Uh, so, it can uh, observe uh, for surfaces also, it can observe for uh, powder samples also, it can observe for scaffolds and uh, liquid samples also you can do under the FTR analysis where you. So, I will first explain the methods. So, transmission FTR spectroscopy is the widely used method where you keep the sample in the path of the IR and it will uh, uh, detect uh, the spectrum and uh, it will show how much of the light has been transmitted uh, through the sample and uh, based on that it will uh, plot the spectrum. Then ATR FTR spectroscopy is the attenuated total reflectance where you have a reflective surface uh, at the bottom where uh, the light source would be reflected to and fro through the sample and the reflective surface and the final uh, uh, amplified uh, that reflection will be uh, detected using uh, detector. Then drift spectroscopy it is diffuse reflection infrared uh, Fourier transform where the uh, it is similar to the transmission uh, spectroscopy, but it would be uh, up to a particular depth it would be diffuse the IR uh, rays would diffuse and then it would be reflected back into the uh, detector. Then reflectance micro FTR which is a new techniques where uh, which is a new technique where you have a very micro sample which would be uh, which has a high sensitivity uh, where the IR source can be 
uh, reflected and it can be detected for the very small amount of sample with high sensitivity. So, for the liquid sample you can form a uh, thin film like uh, there would be a casing where you can drop the liquid uh, onto that casing. So, it will form a thin liquid film and that can be measured using transmittance uh, uh, FTR spectroscopy. So, if you are having a film or material uh, opaque material and all you can because transmittance it has to IR has to pass through there should be some IR has to be passed through if it is completely blocked you cannot uh, observe any spectrum. So, to have a to avoid that uh, obstacle we are we will use a FTR, ATR FTR spectroscopy which will have a reflective surface. Uh, so, that if your material is uh, highly opaque that will uh, so, the spectrum uh, in, uh, produce the spectrum and for the transmittance spectroscopy we use KBR as a uh, molecule because uh, KBR has a IR uh, background uh, which is uh, standard for all the uh, IR. So, if you are mixing the KBR with your sample and uh, checking for the spectrum uh, that will uh, have a background KBR would be background would be reduced. Okay. So, this is how a normal FTR spectrum looks. Uh, this is an example of toluene where you have a each of the CH stretching, uh, CC stretching in the aromatic ring because CC at a normal bonds it would be different and it would inside aromatic ring the stretching would be constrained. So, each will have a different uh, wavelength. So, different wave number. So, based on that we will identify what are the functional groups present. So, these are the commonly available functional groups. So, each has a different uh, uh, frequency available. So, alcohols and uh, carboxylic acids will have a range at uh, 3000 to 3300 centimeter inverse and if you are looking into uh, ester bonds and uh, amine bonds and all you can uh, look into uh, around 1700 centimeter inverse and all. So, FTR technique uh, will show what are the functional groups available, but if you are preparing a new material which is having a same functional groups and all then it would be difficult to know because the same functional groups will overlap with each other. So, you cannot have the exact mechanism to be found and all. So, it is a uh, uh, technique where you can optimize the reactions and all, but you cannot fully depend on FTA. Okay.